Hi guys, I'm kind of excited today because I just got something in the mail that um, I've been waiting for a long time. This is the Moment Anamorphic lens that's going to fit on the uh, Mavic 2 Pro that I have right here. And um, <clears throat> I decided I was going to do a little video. I get lucky this afternoon, right before it rained, it's supposed to rain and snow tomorrow. I was able to go out there and get a little bit of footage so I can actually show you what an anamorphic lens is. And, uh, and what it does and, and why it's actually such a really cool thing. So, so right here what I got is what basically came in the mail. Now I opened these boxes right here. These are our boxes for the filters. I did get the kit that has the filter in it. So uh, this comes with uh, five different filters. Now the filters are pretty cool. They're very, very lightweight. Uh, this is ND4, uh, 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64. So it goes all the way to 64 which I probably will never use unless I do some really slow motion stuff. But um, this morning I flew with the ND4 just because it was a little overcast out there and not really a whole need for anything. But these things are kind of amazing. They're really, really lightweight. And you can see them right here. This is the filter and, um, and it's going to mount onto the lens. So let's take a look at the lens real quick because this lens is really cool as well. It comes in this box right here. So I'm going to put this down for a second and here you can see as I'm opening this up, uh, you can see right here we have the lens in itself. So I'm going to hold it up a little bit right here with this camera. Um, the lens comes with a cap on it, a cap in the front and a cap in the back. And uh, this thing is really neat. Now, it's, uh, it looks like it's curved. When you look at it, it looks like it's got a curve to it, uh, but it actually doesn't. It's just because of the way anamorphic lenses work. Um, and it's gonna fit right onto the, uh, onto the Mavic Pro, the Mavic 2 right here, which is sitting right here. So uh, this thing has, you can see right here, it has a side that's gonna uh, clip up around. And then in the box right here, what we have too is, we have this um, counterweight that's gonna go in the back of the um, of the, the, the camera gimbal. Now this is kind of nerve wracking at first. Uh, this thing is going to um, basically go in the back and it, it fits, I mean it fits so tight. Um, and I'm gonna show you what I, what I had to do several times. So um, I'll, walk through, I'll walk you through the steps in a minute, but first I wanna show you kind of what you get out of this uh, super cool lens and then kind of the concept behind why you want to use an anamorphic lens and how it works. So in order to do this, I'm actually going to go in Photoshop. And in Photoshop, what I'm going to show you is uh, I'm going to show you the footage that I got today. Now, Photoshop, I know, is for pictures. And, uh, and um, I'm just taking a print screen of one of the shots that I took. And I'm going to show you kind of what it looks like because it's, um, it's really interesting. So. The first thing here that I want to do looking at this screen is you can see this is a shot of me and uh, and I'm and I am tall and skinny but I'm not this tall and skinny. So what you see in here is you see a footage that has been squished and this is exactly what the anamorphic lens is going to do. It's going to squeeze your footage. Now you're going to say why in the world would you want to squeeze your footage? Well you want to squeeze it so that you can actually unsqueeze the footage later on and get something that's going to be like a panoramic view. Let me show you the example here. So I'm going to go in Photoshop right here and I'm going to show you the size of the image. Now, the size of the image here, you can see dimensions 3840 by 2160. This is a 4K image. I was recording in 4K, which makes sense. And this is what I got out of it. Now, the, uh, the thing with this 4K image is that it's squeezed. Now, let's take a look at some ratios. I created this table right here that's going to show you a bunch of ratios that you see in typical uh, photography, videography. Now, 3 2 is kind of a ratio that you see sometimes on uh, photography, but the 4 3rd ratio is, is if you're old enough and you remember the old uh, TVs, this is how the old TVs were recorded. You had kind of a square looking uh, image, and that was a 4 3rd ratio. Now, you can look at ratios two different ways. You've heard 4 3rd, you've heard 16 9, I'm sure. But we can look at it slightly differently. We can look at it as a ratio over one. Four third is 1.33 over one. And then 69 is 1.78 over one. Now this is kind of important for 
what we're gonna look at next, which is these formats right here. These formats right here are formats for cinematic shots. Now you've seen the movies in the theater and you notice that it's not exactly a 69 ratio. If you have a 69 TV at home and you watch the TV, the, the movie on the 69, then you have these black bars at the top. These are the ratios that we have right here. Now, there's about four or five of them for the cinematic world. I'm putting all of them in here, but really we're gonna keep it simple. We're only gonna keep one, which is this one right here, 2.37 over one. Now, with that being said, you notice in here what I did at 2.37 to one, ratio, that's not a 16 to one ratio, it's a 21 to one ratio. It's a very wide format, okay? If we look at an image side, let's, let's take the size of a, um, a, um, a 1920 by 1080. This is your typical uh, HD image, 1920 by 1080. This is a 16 to nine ratio. So if you divide these two numbers, you're gonna get 16 divided by nine. and uh, if we look at it from a 4K perspective, we have 3840 by 2160. Does that sound familiar? If I go back to my Photoshop right here and I do my image size, 3840 by 2160, that's our 4K image. So back to Excel right here. If we take that image and we look at it from a, this ratio right here, then this ratio is 3840 by 1620. Now you notice we still have the 3840, but now instead of having 2160, we have 1620. Now we lost some of the image. It has been not compressed this way, but what happened is that we have a white image and we have black frames on the top of it. And this is exactly what we're going to do with our image right here that I have. You notice I'm tall and skinny right here, but what happens is if I do this and I change my image right here, and I'm gonna remove the ratio and I'm gonna move this to pixels, okay? 3840 by 2160. I'm gonna replace the 2160 by 1620, which is exactly what we have here. 1620 right here. And now I'm gonna click okay. And wait a second, and there it is, okay? Now you've been looking at it for a while, so you think I'm really tall and skinny and this makes me look really small and chubby, but uh, this is about the way I look on the camera when you have the proper ratio. Now, you notice what happened here is that all of a sudden I have a very panoramic image and I'm gonna have black bars. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna to go to my canvas. Now the canvas is the entire image here, and I'm gonna make my canvas instead of uh, here, I'm gonna make this back to 2160. And I'm gonna leave it with a white background so you can see exactly what's gonna happen. And there it is. Now we have our black bars, white bars in this case, and this is exactly what's gonna to happen to the image. Our image is going to turn into an image with white bars at the top black bars um, to fill in the rest of our 4K image. So this is exactly what you get from something like this that's an anamorphic lens. It's going to squeeze your footage so that later on you can actually unsqueeze it. Now, I'm gonna show you a little technique in a minute because there's two ways to do this. We can squeeze the image even more, but squeeze it this way around the, uh, the Y axis, or we can actually stretch the image around the, Z, the X axis, which is the next thing that I'm gonna show you, okay? So that's the basic of the anamorphic lens. Now, before we get into the detail of how we're gonna treat this image right here, I'm going to go and show you how to install this lens and kind of the issues that I went through uh, this afternoon to try to put it on. So let's go ahead and uh, I'm gonna push this away. Uh, I'm actually gonna close this right here. And then I'm gonna bring this drone right here. Now, the drone right here is gonna be connected to my uh, GoPro, to my, to my iPad, and then here's my controller. So I just do a direct uh, control straight to the, to the, uh, the controller, uh, just so I can record this screen right here so you can see what's going on. But, um, so the first thing is, let me start recording with this little guy right here. And uh, so what you see right here is my lens. Here's my regular lens from the get-go. And, uh, and I have a filter on it. Now I use the Polar Pro filters and um, I'm gonna actually remove this filter because that's what we wanna do when we do this installation. So first thing is remove this. And uh, I have my box right here, so I'm gonna keep them and just put them in here. And from here, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna start the drone like this. Now, here's a note that nobody really is telling you in any of these images. If you're buying one of these things, and if you're buying one of these anamorphic lens right here for a moment, you're gonna to have to do this process that I'm gonna go through right now before each flight. 
There is no putting the lens on, turning the drone on, and then hoping that it works. It doesn't work. You have to take it off before you turn on the drone, which means that every time you change the battery, you have to do this. It's a bit of a pain, but I'll tell you what, it's totally worth it from the little flight that I did this afternoon before it gets too cold, okay? So, uh, before I turn this on, I want to point out, I'm, I have filters right here, and I'm actually going to be using these filters uh, to, uh, to do stuff. So, I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, put one of the filter on here because when you balance this thing you want to balance it with the filters on so let's go ahead and do this I'm going to put one of the filter on so here I'm going to take the 4 and the 4 filter and I'm going to put it right here and simply now you see in here there's there's a little M right here and there's a little 1 over um, 3 3 down here now this right here you can see that the way that it moves it uh, it can eclipse I'm going to try to do it so you can see it you see how that moves? That's gonna go at the bottom. That's gonna go at the bottom of your lens and it's gonna clip. So when it's done, it's gonna go like this and it's gonna clip in, okay? So, um, so let's put this on. Let's put the filter on. Now, very simple. You see the, uh, the little M logo on this one side. I hope you do. I'm just gonna line it up with the M. I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna line it up right here with the M this way. And that's it. This is how it clips, very simple, very lightweight. So, next step, we have to turn on the drone, we have to turn on the controller, and we have to turn on our iPad. And I'm gonna start recording on the iPad as well at the same time, mm -hmm. so you guys can see what's going on here. So here what we're gonna do is, let's go to the DJI Go4 app, and we are going to go and uh, go fly. I'm not gonna fly, but... And when you get here, as my shirt, now there's a compass error because oh, well, I was messing with it earlier, didn't calibrate. But uh, what you have here is what we need to do now that we're in here and we have the, the drone turned on, this is important. You're gonna flip this thing over just like this. And I know this is kind of weird. Yeah, add you mode. But this is kind of weird, but you basically this is what you have to do. And then from here, what we have to do is we have to move the gimbal. Now this is not for the faint of heart, you have to move the gimbal as it is turned on. Now, you have to grab this thing, which is your, uh, your counterweight from the back, okay? It says moment in the back, and you have to turn this, now the fan is turning on, you have to turn this like this on the side, and you have to clip this thing onto the back. I know, it's gonna nerve wracking, like I said. Now, what happens is, when you do this to the gimbal, the gimbal kind of disconnects, so the motors are turned off. Now, what I want you to notice in here, I'm gonna do it from the very top. This thing has to be centered. Now, this is kind of difficult to see, but on each side, the clamp has to be centered nicely, or else it's gonna to touch and rub in the back. Now, another thing, I'm gonna take this off again because I forgot. I'm gonna take this off and then, uh, notice, when I take it off, if you wait a few seconds, Eventually what's going to happen is that the gimbal is going to go back to its original kind of self right here. It's going to self-center eventually. But um, one thing that I want to mention is in the back right here of this thing, there's little pads, like foam pads. What I did earlier is I actually kind of pushed on them like this. Uh, the reason for this is because it was just not fitting and it was rubbing in the back. And even during operation, it seemed to be rubbing a little bit. So uh, make sure that you do this to your, <coughs> to your foam pads. So again, I'm going to go back, I'm going to tilt this thing, and I'm going to clamp this in the back, and I'm going to make sure, again, that it's nicely centered, and I'm also going to be kind of pushing on it. Now, be careful, your gimbal is pretty fragile, so, and I'm now I'm going to take my lens right here, and on the top right here, at the very top, what we have is, um, is the clip, the, the part that kind of moves. And I'm going to go and clip it at the bottom right here, and then clip it at the top, and clip, clip, and that's it. Now, when you move it this way, I'm gonna do it again right here. When you move it this way, make sure it doesn't rub in the back. And if it rubs in the back, you need to push that little foam back in place. Now, I'm gonna let it sit right here. And when I do, you notice now it's, it's kind of stabilizing itself back to normal. The motors are re-engaging. And now I can flip this thing over like a little turtle back onto the front like this. Now the gimbal is kind of weird right now, which makes sense, okay, because we just moved it around. We just need to go in here into our 
um, GoPro app. And what we're going to do is we're going to go and click on the top right right here. And we're going to go right here where it's get the gimbal. And we're going to do uh, gimbal auto calibration. It says tip, make sure it's level. It is level. You can see it right here. And I'm going to click OK. And now it's counting. Now, here's the trick. It may be counting and staying on 10 until this thing right here, until the gimbal is kind of not moving anymore and kind of centered by itself, it's going to be stuck on 10. Another thing that it may say is um, um, gimbal motors overload. If it says gimbal motors overload, it's because the back is probably rubbing. So make sure that you squeeze it nicely. Or it may say gimbal motor overload, which happened to me on the field. And then eventually the gimbal re-centers and then it goes back to the calibration. Another thing that happened to me as well today, so this is like three things already that you need to be ready for, is that my calibration went to 80%, then 89%, then it went back down to 80%, then to 89, 80, 89, it kept doing this between 80 and 89% and it never stopped. So what I actually did is I killed the app and then I, I turned this off, I took the gimbal out, uh, not the gimbal, the, the lens out, and then I went back and put it back on and went through the process again. A bit of a pain, but you know what? Like I said, it is totally worth it. So now you have your lens on there. You have your uh, thing that's calibrated. You're ready to go fly. Oh, finally got GPS uh, inside my studio. Now I'm not gonna fly in my studio. My studio is fairly small. Uh, but now you can basically go take off and go fly. Now I'm gonna show you some of the footage that I got, and then I'm gonna show you kind of what it's gonna look like uh, when we start squeezing and unsqueezing the footage uh, using the software. But um, so few words, don't go too fast. If it's very windy outside, it was very windy for me uh, going into the wind with this thing. This thing is pretty heavy. It's pretty nose heavy and it's got the gimbal, the, the counterweight in the back. Don't go too fast or the gimbal is going to go bam and it's just going to drop down. If you wait and stop, then the gimbal is going to come back up all by itself. Okay. Um, if you go in sports mode, it's not going to work very well. Now, I haven't tried it, but I read it on the website. They say not to do it, so don't do it. Uh, it's going to drop again. And then at one point, I get a little bit of a, of a ticker. Again, it could be because it was windy outside, not the best conditions. But overall, so far, I'm really happy with this. I can't wait to go and get more footage. But um, this is how you do it. Now, when you're done, turn this thing off. And you have to go in here and um, wait until it's done. And then basically put it on its back like a turtle again. And then you can see the clip right here. All you have to do is you can press, it says push to eject, push right here. And then the gimbal comes out, the lens comes out completely. And when you're done, just put your uh, lens back into its nice case. Well, actually, before you do that, put this thing back on. So it goes, you have to take the filter out first. If you do this on the field, by the way, when it's very cold outside and you're not dressed like I was today, um, <laughs> you do this really quickly. Uh, but you have to be careful. This is very sensitive. So and put it in here and then close it back. And there it is. You've got your uh, little gimbal uh, done. And then you put it back into its case right here uh, neatly. And same for the counterweight. Now, the counterweight was a bit of a pain in the butt earlier to um, to get off. So you have to tilt it. There you go. I couldn't really do this really well on the field. Uh, it was a little bit harder. But when you're done, you can put this back uh, basically right in here into the case and, um, and then you're done. Closed. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at some footage. Let's see what we can do in editing the footage and how you're going to and de-squeeze and unsqueeze and re-squeeze, whatever you're doing, a whole bunch of squeezing going on. So in here from our footage, what you see is, uh, I'm just going to show you again in Photoshop the two techniques. I've shown you one already and I'm going to show you another one now. So this was the squeezing on the, on the vertical axis, okay, on the, on the Y axis. What we do is we are done now and we have a a footage that is 3840 by 2160 with black frames. You don't have to do the black frame by any mean. You can just go back and do it this way, 3840 by 1620. And that still gives you a 4K image that's going to be uh, just nice and wide and panoramic. Um, 
One of the questions is you're gonna say, well, why would you wanna do this? Why can't you just squeeze other footage? Well, it doesn't really look the same. The anamorphic lens has this thing where it increases the angle. Now, the way that this would look like in real life, if you had um, your regular footage, I'm gonna show you what uh, it would look like in real life. And I'm gonna bring this back to 2160 here. Um, I'm gonna do this with the image. I'm gonna bring my image to 2160 like this in 5120. Now, in real life, if you were to record this without the lens on top of it, this is what it would look like. It would look like, um, it would look like this number here, 3840 and crop. This is what the image would look like right here. You'd have a normal shot right here. But when you record because it's squeezed and because it's re really recording a much wider angle right here, then what you're actually getting is something like this. You're getting additional footage recorded on top of what your sensor already records. You're getting extra image added to your footage, which is pretty awesome. So the other question that you may ask is, well, why don't you just get a wider angle? Well, you can't on this lens. You can't get a different lens on there. You can't get a wider angle. But even then, a wide angle does not do the same amount of changes to the image. This is more like having a panoramic, imagine taking kind of two images and putting them together and getting something wider. This is exactly what this lens is gonna to do to your footage. Now what it's gonna do is it's gonna make it look like you're capturing a lot more stuff in your image and it's gonna really make it look cinematic. And that's the advantage of this lens is to make everything look cinematic. Now, what I did actually right here is I already did the change that I wanna show you, which is the stretching of the image. So I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna go back to uh, 3840, which is our original, 3840 is our original image. This is kind of what we started with, okay? An image at 3840 by 2160 that kind of looks squeezed. That's straight out of the camera. One of the things that you can do is you can do this. You can stretch the image this way. Now, this lens is what we call a 1.33 ratio. 1.33 ratio, which means that in order to expand it, you have to multiply the x-axis, the uh, 3840 right here, by 1.33. Or you have to squeeze the the, z, the, the, the y-axis this way by 1.33 ratio, a 33% reduction or a 33% expansion. If I do a 33% a reduction, which is what I did the very first time. Then I would do 2160, and I'm gonna do the calculator here, 2160 divided by 1.33, which tells me 1624. So here, if I do 1624, then I have my image the right format. If I go in the opposite direction and stretch it, then now I'm gonna stretch my 3840. So again, I'm gonna go 3840, multiply that by 1.33, which gives us 5107. So here I'm gonna go 5107 and boom, here's what I have, the same image, okay? Except now this image is 5107 by 2160. I kept my 2160 and I widened the other one as opposed to keeping the 3840 and squeezing it in this direction. You're gonna say which one is the right way to do it. Well, it depends. It depends on what your client wants if you're doing this for a, for a commercial shoot. But I can tell you that when you do this, when you stretch, you're using pixels that don't really exist and you're stretching it. Just like if you had a small image that's 1080 and you try to stretch it to a canvas that's 4K, then you're gonna lose quality because you're scaling up. It's called scaling up, okay? Um, so in this case, this is not the technique that I'm gonna use to do my footage, uh, because what you're doing is you're just stretching, and quite frankly, you're getting something that's 5107 wide, which is more than 4K. Now, I don't know about you, but all I have is in my office, I have a 5K screen, which is pretty huge. This would play on a 5K screen, but it's overkill. Most people will have max a 4K camera, a 4K a screen that they will play this on. So why not just stay with the 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 um, the, the original the 4096 that we had originally right here. And then instead, what you're going to do is you're going to squeeze the image this way into the uh, into this format here. And I forgot already what the number is, but uh, 1620 or 1624. It doesn't really matter. Um, 
1620 right here. Squeeze it, and there you go. Oh, that doesn't look right. Oh, 3840, that's why, blah. <laughs> See, 4096 is, in, is another format for 4K. There you go, 3840, and then here, keep that at, uh, and I forgot again, 1620. All right, 1620 right here. There you go, that looks better. Now I've got my nice panoramic view, okay? That's the basic. Now, let's go ahead and let me show you how you would do this. If you're using Final Cut, now I'm not using Premiere, I'm a Mac guy, I like Final Cut, that's, what, that's the stuff that I use. But here's the footage that I did earlier, and I already changed some of it, so I'm actually gonna delete this. I live close to a golf course. Now granted, this is, this is just a test footage, this is not something that I did for uh, cinematic purposes. Uh, I just wanted to see what, the, what this was gonna look like. So, uh, let me delete this and let me remove this way here. Okay, so if I take this, first off, uh, I'm gonna start from scratch. I'm gonna start from scratch and I'm gonna do a new, um, uh, a new project, okay? And in my new project, I'm gonna do a 4K project. This is what I want as my output. This is what I want as my last video. 3840 by 2160, does that look familiar? And I actually shot this at 2398, doesn't matter, but I'm gonna put this in here. And uh, this footage was shot in uh, RAW and, uh, or in uh, the 10-bit, the, um, yeah, and also with the, uh, uh, so it can be looted afterwards with a lot on top. So it doesn't look amazing, but this is my project right here. Uh, and the footage needs to, is very dull on purpose. So I'm gonna drag one of the footage right here. Now you can see, you, you're not familiar with the area, but you can see that this looks kinda squeezed, okay? It looks squeezed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to squeeze it this way. I'm gonna squeeze it this way. And the way that I'm gonna do this is I'm going to scale this down right here, okay? On the Y axis, I'm gonna bring this down. So I'm going from 100%, and I'm dividing 100% by 1.33, and that's 75.2. So I'm gonna do 75.2 right here, and I'm gonna hit this. Now you notice what happened all of a sudden is now I have my footage, I'm gonna play it so you can see it. I have my footage that's playing right here, and it is nice and wide and, 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 uh, and panoramic, and it's very, it's, it just looks good. When you, when you know what this looks like, it just looks good, okay? So you have a lot more image than you would otherwise, and it's got a little black bar on the top. So now this is the case where I want to do this as having black bars. One thing that I can do is I can create the footage so it doesn't have black bars, in which case what I would do is a new project right here, and I would do uh, 4K, 3840 by 2160. I'm going to do custom and 3840 by the number that we had before, which is 1620. And I'm gonna do the 24 frame, click OK. Now I created a new project right here. So what you're gonna do in this case, if you're using this technique, then you're gonna go click on your footage right here first, and then you're gonna go to type, fill, okay? And you're gonna drag it. Now, here's what happens. It still is the original format that we have, which is squeeze. So now we have to squeeze it this way. And then the way you do it, you can see right here, if I do this, uh, you can see the, the top and the bottom right here, that's the entire image. I can bring these two back right here. Uh, I can do this, or I can go with my numbers again. Uh, let's go back, there you go. And then on the Y scale here, I'm gonna do 75%. If I do 75%, bring it back. And now I have a footage that when I export it, is not gonna have the black bars on top, and it's gonna basically look wide and is going to be uh, the right width of pixel, which is our 3860 uh, width of pixel, the uh, 3840 width of pixel that we have right um, from the get-go for the 4K. Except now it's gonna be 21 and change, 2100 and change in height. I hope I didn't lose anyone, but this is, I'm, I'm kind of excited about this. Now, I wanna show you what the actual footage would look like if it were taken from the actual camera. Uh, without the without the lens on top of it because I did a test like this. So uh, this is my footage right here. I'm gonna drag it. And uh, now, because I put it in, uh, let me do this again. Uh, because I put it in, as, I'm gonna have to do it as fit in this case. And I'm gonna put it right here. And there you go. 
This is the actual footage. You see the black bars on the right side. It basically means that I'm missing some of the footage. Now, it doesn't look nearly as good because it's not as wide angle. It's not as, as uh, panoramic as the other footage. I can, I'm gonna stop right here. See this, I'm gonna put a marker so you can see it. And I'm gonna go back to the same footage here from this side. Um, there you go, it's kind of the same footage. You can see here and you can see here. Okay, too many, a little bit more rocks. There you go. You can see this footage right here and then this footage right here. You see the difference between the two? One has a lot more on the left side than the other. Just make it more cinematic. This is what you get when you get this, this super cool moment uh, lens. It's a little finicky, okay? I'm not gonna lie. Uh, it's a bit of a pain that you have to do the process of calibration each flight, unless I'm wrong, which I hope I am. Uh, but if somebody knows of a better way to do this, uh, but otherwise, I mean, this footage is just incredible. So I'm gonna go out some more over the, uh, the Christmas break here and get some more footage for you guys uh, so I can show you what this thing actually looks like. But for right now, I'm really impressed and I'm really excited. And um, that's it, I'm gonna end. I know this is kind of a long video uh, compared to what I usually do, but I really wanted to show you all of this cool stuff and kind of explain what the anamorphic is because a lot of people are confused and, um, and really what you get out of it and why you probably should get one. Now, I'm not getting any money from you guys buying one of these, uh, but, uh, but I do think it's cool. So um, moment anamorphic goes on the Mavic 2.0, uh, Mavic 2 Pro. And um, that's it, that's all I have. I'll see you guys on Friday for the news update.